Amen. So you're there in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and uh, this first verse here is our memory verse, uh, but the name of the sermon is Flies in the Ointment. Flies in the Ointment. And uh, this may be even a phrase that you've heard before, um, but uh, let's read the first three verses here. It says, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. And so uh, this verse uh, kind of, it sticks out to me uh, because actually there's, there's, a, there's something that happened when I was like in elementary school that makes me think of this verse. And you're like, that's really weird. But what this really comes down to is someone that is known to be a really good person, you know, or someone that's, uh, let's say, just usually does right, and then they don't do right. They do something wrong. It sticks out like a sore thumb, right? And uh, I still remember, because when I was in elementary school, at least in elementary school, I was extremely quiet, meaning, like, I just did what my teachers told me. I didn't, I, 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 rarely ever acted up actually to the point where uh we'd go to like a teacher's conference or like the, the teachers would talk to my parents and uh they said man your 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 son's like an angel you know like he just never does anything wrong and then they're just laughing like yeah well something changes when he comes home so <laughs> but uh especially in middle school when the, because that's when they said that they're like you know when he comes home that's he's a whole different animal uh, but anyway that being said i was not a perfect child but at school, I was super shy, so I just didn't usually act up. I wasn't the, uh, the kids that were like getting into trouble or whatever. And I still remember in elementary school, I did something wrong. Like it was one of those things where like there's other kids were doing stuff and you're following them all to do evil kind of thing. And uh, it was nothing like serious, but it was enough to where like, let's say we weren't supposed to be talking and I, was, and I started talking to somebody, like someone was talking to me. And the teacher, I still remember this to this day, came down hard on me. And I'm like, what in the world? I'm like, this person over here is talking every single day, disobeying every single day, and you're just like, you know, like kind of flipping about that person even getting in trouble. I do one thing wrong, one thing, and it's just like crucified, essentially. And I remember that to this day, like, man, that seems, why am I being singled out when I'm like good most all the time, and then I make one mistake, and then it's just like the end of the world, the teacher's coming down on me. It just seemed really unfair, okay? So I remember that, and it sticks with me. When I read this verse, I'm like, yep, that's exactly what it comes down to is why. Because someone that's in had in reputation for wisdom and honor, meaning someone that's in reputation for being good or being like a good person and doing right, when they do folly, it stinks. Like it's something that, when someone else that just does wrong all the time, it's just kind of like, yeah, that's expected. It's not really something that's just going to stand out. But if you're in had and reputation for being, you know, righteous and all that, you know, and this could go into many realms as far as what are we talking about. That second verse there, you're like, why did you read the second verse? Because, you know, it just shows you that the Bible says politically you should be right and not left. Because if you're left, you're a fool, you're right, you're wise. So... I don't think that's what it's talking about, <laughs> but, uh, but it, anyway, I, every time I read this, who does not read that and think about the political left and the political right? I mean, come on. Um, but, I mean, if you're not left, you're right. So, um, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 1. Don't get me wrong, the right is wrong a lot of the times, too. When I'm talking about the politi politics, most of those that are on the right are uh, a bunch of uh, Posers, they don't actually, uh, you know, stand for the values that they even say they stand for. Okay. Um, but in, in Ecclesiastes chapter seven verse one, it says, "A good name is better than precious ointment, in the day of death and the day of one's birth." Now, I don't believe this is talking about like what your name actually is, as far as like, that's a good name. Like it sounds cool. That's a cool name, you know. That's not what I believe it's talking about. I believe it's talking about you have a good name because you have a good reputation, okay? Like that name is, is had in reputation, 
right? And it's like a precious ointment, okay? But if that name is tarnished, or if there's a, a folly, a little folly, and notice that it's just a little bit, right? Think about, and you, you say, what in the world are we even talking about with the ointment of the apothecary, okay? So basically, the ointment of the apothecary, you know, basically you mix spices and all this stuff, and think of an apothecary, you think of like something where you're grinding down something. It's like a, it's like a crucible kind of thing. That probably didn't help. Um, <laughs> it's basically like a bowl, okay, that you take something and you kind of mix it around in, okay? You do this for like drugs, you do this for spices, you do this for other things. Um, and so that's what we're talking about here. It's basically ointment being made. But if a fly gets in there, it makes it stink, okay? Dead flies in the ointment of the apothecary send this forth a stinking savor. And it's giving you an example that the ointment's great, right? The ointment is good and there's nothing wrong with the ointment, but the dead flies that got into it made it rancid. It made it disgusting. It made it smell horrible, right? And that's the example it's giving as far as just a little folly. Notice a little folly. It's not saying like, oh, you know, this person was doing great and then he murdered somebody. That's not a little folly, okay? That's messed up, you know? That's, that's major sins. I'm talking a little folly that's going on there. Go to Ecclesi or I'm sorry, uh, go to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. There's two main points that I'm going to get across here, or I want to get across, is the fact that we as Christians need to know that we need to be living above reproach. Okay, meaning this is that everybody's eyes are, especially if you're preaching the truth and you're trying to change people's minds about what the truth is and what righteousness is, eyes are going to be on you, and any little bit of folly is going to like basically stand out. Okay, Not to put a whole bunch of pressure on you, because here's the thing, when it comes down to this, <laughs> If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, okay? No one's sinlessly perfected, but this is something we should be striving for, knowing that the world is looking at us with a microscope, right? They're, they're trying to pick us apart. They're trying to find something to say, hey, that person right there stinks because of this little thing they do wrong over here, okay? And what we, want, what we need to do as Christians is make that as scarce as possible, okay? Um, and so, but Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 21, remember how I said it didn't seem fair, right? It doesn't seem fair that that would be the case. Well, one, you need to understand this is that to whom much is given of him shall be much required, right? Meaning this is that, you know, as if you're going to try to live above reproach, there's going to be a lot more at stake to keep that, that reputation, if you will, than if you're just living down here in the gutter at that point. If you do anything good, it's kind of like, oh man, you did something. And that's what I felt like when I was in elementary, when I was in school, I felt like this one person over here does like one thing right and they're just like praising and they're like, that's great, that's great. I do one thing wrong and I'm just like punished to the 10th degree and I'm just like, this isn't fair, okay? But it's just a fact of life, okay? And Ecclesiastes really shows you in a lot of cases just facts of life, whether you like it or not, that's just facts, okay? Someone that is a horrible person does one thing right, and everybody's just like, that's awesome, he finally did something good. And then, one, then the good person does something, and one little thing wrong, and they're just like, oh, what's wrong, what, what's up, man? You fallen? You, what? You know, and then they just get on you really hard about it, okay? Now, in Ezekiel chapter 18, and verse 24, it says, but when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? So that's a question that's being asked. Like, you're, you do all this righteousness, but then you turn and try to do things that the wicked do. It's like, are you going to be, are you going to live? And these are talking about sins that are more dealing with capital punishment, right? We're talking about, like, the death penalty type of sins, abominations that would be associated with that. Notice it says, all his righteousness that he had done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he had trespassed, and in his sin that he had sinned, in them shall he die. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committed iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he had done, shall he die. So this, you know, when you look at this, you say this doesn't seem fair. Okay, it doesn't seem fair that it's this way. 
but is it not equal? Is it not right that someone... Now, obviously, the people that are praising a wicked person for doing one great thing, you know, I'm not saying that's fair necessarily. I'm not saying that whole situation in elementary school was fair, okay? But what you have to understand is that you do folly, you do folly, and you just need to own it, okay? And in the world that we live in, like I said, we're, in a mi- we're under this microscope where they're just trying to pick you apart. They're trying to find something wrong with you. And when they do, they're going to try to point it out. Okay? And so we need to be living in that manner that is going to kind of deal with that. And whether you think that's fair or not, it doesn't really matter. Okay? Because here's the thing. To God, it doesn't really – our standards to God. Okay? So let's, let's take everybody else out of the picture as far as what everybody else thinks. Our standards to God. And the Bible says that, you know, that we should be perfect even as our Heavenly Father is perfect, and we should be striving to be that way, okay? So the one great thing, which the, the second point I'm getting into, is how salvation is by faith and not by works at all, okay? And the fact that those that believe that salvation is free and that it's by faith and not by works at all, then they're going to be looking at the little folly they got to clean up in their life. Unlike the people that think you got to turn from your sins and that you can lose your salvation, they're just worried about the big sins, right? Because they know that they commit little sins all the time and they're not going to be able to stop all those. That they're just like worried, worried about the, the big sins. But if you understand that just a little bit, just a, just a few dead flies in that ointment, sent forth a stinking uh, savor, then you know that, hey, I need to be worried about even these little things. The thought of foolishness. I need to be thinking about, like, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I need to be thinking about things that, that, that maybe even the world wouldn't even look at and say, hey, that's even, a, even something to worry about. Does that make sense? Like, our standards, not what the world think, thinks is right or wrong, right? Because a lot of the big sins that we'd say you shouldn't commit, the world would be like, ah, oh, that's fine. But here's the thing. If you're preaching that it's wrong and then you're doing it, they're going to call you out for it because okay? they're going to call you out as a hypocrite. Now, they're a bunch of hypocrites themselves, okay? So, obviously, you can turn it right back on them and say that they're a bunch of hypocrites, but at the same time, we don't want to give them any ammunition, okay? That's the whole point here is that we want to have a good saver and not a stinking saver, okay? Now, you, can, you don't have to turn there, but Ezekiel 33 basically states the same thing, but it's the idea here is that it doesn't matter how many good things you did, right? You could have just done so many good things. A little folly will send forth a stinking savor. That's the principle I want to get, you know, get across there with Ezekiel. Obviously, Ezekiel is kind of dealing with, uh, you know, a sinning unto death, right? You know, like literally like sinning an abomination that would cause you to be put to death or, or cause you to die in some manner uh, because of that sin. You know, that... That's what that's dealing with. But at the same time, notice that all your righteousness shall not be remembered. It's not, you know, this whole idea, like, your good outweighs your bad, right? All of them will not be remembered. So it's not like, oh, you know, well, I have all these righteousness. Let me pile that on to that one, you know, just to kind of cancel out that iniquity, right? And the same thing here is that that little folly, it doesn't matter how much great that you've done, doesn't matter how good you've been, doesn't matter how many years you've been doing great, that little bit of folly will send forth a stinking savor. And go to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, and what we want to have is a good savor, okay? A good savor toward God, but also toward men, okay? Like I said, it doesn't seem fair. <laughs> but here's the thing. The world isn't fair. And kids, you should know this. The world is not fair. You, you need to learn that at a young age that you don't get necessarily what you deserve. Sometimes that's a good thing, especially with God, that we don't get what we deserve because the Lord is gracious. But in this world, you may not get that promotion that you deserve. You may not get the things that you think that, that are coming to you or that's due to you. The world isn't fair. But we just need to take it on the chin and keep going. And even though the world, it wouldn't be fair, it doesn't seem fair that they're going to like judge us over one little thing that, that we do wrong when there's all this stuff that we've been doing right over here. Okay? 
And, uh, but it is what it is. In Matthew chapter 5, and verse 13, notice what it says here. Matthew 5, verse 13, it says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Now, this is dealing more so with losing savor, not having a stinking savor, but losing savor, okay? But we want to have a good savor. And you say, well, how do you know we're talking about a good savor? And what is that talking about? I believe it's specifically in context here talking about having good works, okay? And notice what it says in verse 14. It says, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we know that good works don't get you to heaven. We know that it's not good works, us doing good works necessarily that's going to cause for that person to get saved. But here's the thing. What they see as far as them going to glorify God by getting saved is they're going to look at your life. They're going to look at what you do. Now, there's going to be some people, and we go out door knocking, they have no idea, right? So when you're going door to door, it may not be as big of a deal, okay? But when you're dealing with coworkers, when you're dealing with family members, when you're dealing with people that know you, people that are around you, they see you out in public, and then you try to give them the gospel, that's where it's important to have a good saver, okay? And... But go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We also should have a sweet savor, okay, towards the Lord. Now, in this case, I believe we're dealing with, uh, I, de- I believe we're dealing with soul winning and just, you know, living for the Lord. And that no matter what the outcome is to the people that we are preaching the gospel to, it's a sweet savor to the Lord, okay? So if you're a soul winner, I believe that, you're obviously applying a sweet savor. You're let, and you have a good savor because you're letting your light so shine before men, right? And that you're not, and in that case, you're not good for nothing either because you're actually being the salt of the earth, okay? Now, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15 here, it says, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and unto the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Okay, so he's basically saying we're not, we're not corrupting the word of God, we're speaking it in truth. Uh, and what are we talking about here? We're talking about preaching the gospel. But he's basically stating here that no matter if that person that you talk to gets saved or not, it's still a sweet savor unto the Lord. That makes sense because we can't force people to get saved. But us preaching sincerely and sincerity and in truth in the sight of God, that's a sweet savor unto the Lord. Okay. But that is going to be even better if you add in that salt, if you add in that that idea of having good works associated with that that you don't have this fault, this little folly that's, that's causing that sweet savor not to be as sweet. Does that make sense? And the idea there is that, uh, I'm going to show you a couple verses, or go to, go to 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, I believe this fits very well with Matthew chapter 5, okay? You say, man, you're, you're being really nitpicky. I'm not being nitpicky. The Bible's being nitpicky, <laughs> okay, first of all. But here's the thing. We need to go on unto perfection, don't we? I mean, you know that it's wrong to murder. You know it's wrong to commit adultery. You know what it's wrong to lie and to steal, to covet after things that don't belong to you, right? Those are major sins. Those are things that we should not be doing. And obviously, we go through those. But how about this? Know this, that a little folly... A little folly will cause you to stink before, before men. And we need to recognize that and try to be at a, a high standard. And now, here's the thing. You can say, well, you know, you as a pastor need to be at that. Sure. 
But let me ask you a question. Those, those qualifications for a pastor, that I have a good report of them that are without, for example, do you, do you think that shouldn't apply to everybody in this room as well? I mean, in order for someone to be a pastor, they had, had someone in the pews had to meet those qualifications. Did you know that I actually wasn't always a pastor? I actually was sitting in the pews at one point, and I was just a church member. So everybody should be striving to have a good report of them that are without. Everybody should be striving to be the sweet-smelling savor of ointment unto the Lord and not have a stinking savor. And, you know, doing iniquity will cause that. I mean, think about Le- Levi and Simeon, or Simeon and Levi, how they ended up killing all that, that whole, like, town because they defiled Dinah, their, their sister. And remember what, what uh, Jacob said? He said, you have made me the stink in the land. Okay? And, you know, you just think about, like, what's that mean to stink? Not like literally you stink like you need to put on deodorant, okay? It's, it's a, basically, it just doesn't, you know what I'm talking about. Just physically, like you don't think that person, you don't like that person because of like maybe one little thing, the one thing they did wrong, okay? And uh, in second, or First Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. You know, this is the, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about getting people saved. And it's stating here that when they behold your good works, you know, that's when people are going to be glorifying God in the day of visitation because it's a righteous person that's giving them the gospel, and you know what? That's going to be, you're going to bear more fruit that way, okay? And I'm not saying that someone that, that's, uh, that has problems with sin can't win someone to Christ, okay? Obviously, there's, there's power in the Word of God. There's power in the gospel. God wants them to get saved, but if you want to not just bear fruit, but bear much fruit, and that your fruit may remain, you know, like, there, there's, there's, Beyond just getting people saved here and there, you want to be able to be getting people saved, you know, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, and, you know, on, and going on from that to lead people in the way of righteousness and that cause them to do likewise and, and all those aspects that are going on there. And the fleshly lust that war against the soul. Remember, our soul, if you're saved, if you believe on Christ, your soul has no sin. Okay. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. But the flesh is not so, because it says, In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. You know, it's sin that dwelleth in me. So it's this battle that's going on with your flesh and your soul. Okay? Inwardly speaking, we're a sweet smelling savor unto the Lord. Does it make sense? Like, at all times. Because we're a child of God. Inwardly, we don't have that, that, that folly or that sin or anything like that. We're completely made new. But on the outside, that's what can cause for that stinking savor because you're getting into fleshly lust. Um, go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Again, what are we doing here? What's the premise of what's being said here? We're giving an answer for the reason of the hope that is in this. What's the hope? The hope of eternal life? Jesus Christ, our hope? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about giving them an answer, meaning that we're, going, we're trying to get them saved, right? And then it goes on to say in verse 16, Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as, evildoer, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Okay, so basically what he's saying is in these situations, they may even come at you and say, hey, that's an evildoer, that person's doing that. But when they're wrong, they're going to be ashamed about it because they falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So what we're talking about here is having a good conversation. Now, conversation could be talking about like conversing with what you say, and I'll get to that. But it, conversation is just conversing. It could, be, it could be just your manner of life, how you deal with people, even if you're not saying anything, right? 
and we need to have a good conversation to where we have a good report of them that are without and that you know what they look at us and be like I may not agree with that person but you know he's doing what he says he, d- he believes in right and I've run into that many times I've run, I, I know people that I see on a weekly basis that that aren't saved that I would consider you know I'm friendly with right because obviously we want to try to win people outside of uh, even door knocking and stuff like that but I've, I've, I've heard people say I don't agree with you but I respect you for what you believe because you actually believe what you, you actually do what you say you believe okay and that's where we want to be we want to be in a spot where even if someone disagrees with us and you know the Bible even talks about having peace with our enemies right to even that level not all enemies you're gonna be able to have peace with right but at the same time some you could even have peace with because they're just like, I disagree with that person vehemently. I think they're completely wrong and out to lunch, but I respect that person because they actually do what they say they believe. That's where we want to be in this life. We want to, listen, we want to be like that righteous. It says the, the wicked flee when no man pursue it, but the righteous are bold as a lion. If you want to have boldness in this world, then you need to get rid of the dead flies in your ointment. And it seems so small okay right but you know what i hate flies and i kill them on a daily basis and you know what however you got to get those dead flies out of the ointment whether with with a salt gun you know whatever you got to use then you need to get rid of them okay because salt is good so and it's good to kill flies too by the way i thank brother joseph for that Uh, that that is a gift that has just been a tool that i've used throughout the years it's been amazing Okay. And I probably saved many chandeliers and, and lights by not hitting them with towels and everything else, trying to kill flies. Go to uh, Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5. And here's some verses just dealing with this idea of communication, our speech, how we talk, how we conduct ourselves, and that, like I said, a little folly. So when I, when I look at that verse, I'm not thinking about major sins right i'm thinking about like little things like little like here's a priority list don't murder people <laughs> and down here on the bottom down here at, and not that it's not important but obviously i'd rather you not kill somebody in cold blood of murder than like say something that's you shouldn't say <laughs> does that make sense and so obviously there's a there's a scale there but we need to be careful on this now verse five it says colossians chapter four and verse five it says walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So our speech should be with grace. It says seasoned with salt. Now, that could be, you know, like you think about someone being salty, right? And the fact that maybe what you're saying isn't necessarily um, fun to hear, right? Because a lot of the Bible, I would say, is a little salty, if you were to look at it in that aspect. And the fact that it's true, it's great, but at the same time, it might sting a little bit, right? If you have an open wound that you're dealing with, a little salt is going to hurt, okay? And our, our speech should be always with grace, seasoned with salt, right? It shouldn't be, our, our speech shouldn't be salty, seasoned with a little bit of grace, okay? It should be the other way around, okay? And that's the way we should conduct ourselves, meaning this is that we're, why are you having a conversation with somebody, right? The, the, the thing that you have to think about is like, why are you, why are you even conversing with this person? Is it just to win the argument, or are you actually trying to help that person out? Now, there's some cases where I'm conversing with someone so that people around will hear and understand that this person is, is like a false prophet, or this person's wicked, or, or something like that. Does it make sense? But if I'm just having a, a conversation one-on-one with somebody, then it's gonna, it, you know, that person, I'm, I, I want, there's a reason why I'm trying to talk to them about a certain subject because I care about them, there's grace involved, but there might be a little bit of salt that, I have, that I'm adding in there because you know, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful, right? The idea there is sometimes you need to put a little salt in the wound to get them to wake up to the wound, right? They don't even realize they're bleeding out and uh, you have to like get in there and uh, say something that maybe will hurt their feelings, maybe will you know, just hurt in general, whatever. Um, but go to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. 
Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 15. I kind of hit on this verse uh, when we were in Exodus because it talks about, and all the things that I've said unto you, be circumspect. Okay? And we were talking about how, uh, what circumspect means, but it basically means something that you are kind of mindful and, and cautious. You're like you're, you're being very vigilant about that you're doing, right? You're not just, just lackadaisy about it. So uh, it says in verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Okay? And redeeming the time is brought up in Colossians as well. Um, but redeeming the time, knowing this is that we have a short time. We only have a short amount of time. We have to be efficient with our time. And you say, well, you know, we can still get people saved. And you can still win people to Christ, even if you're not living this great Christian life, because, you know, the word of God's powerful and, and the gospel's powerful. And, and obviously you're still saved. You can still get them saved. But here's the thing, redeeming the time, though. Let me ask you a question. You know that, that old song, it's worth it just for one person to get saved? Listen, if I only got one person saved in my whole life, you know, that's better than none. Okay? But let's be honest here. Would I rather get one person saved or hundreds or thousands? Right? I mean, that whole, that whole like, song sometimes I think is an excuse for people to be lazy. When the, the, the fields are wide unto harvest, but here's the thing. When it comes to this, if you don't purge yourself from the dead flies, if you will, right? But obviously the Bible talks about purging, you know, that, that Jesus will purge the branches, that it will bring forth more fruit. You need to purge yourselves from sins. You need to purge yourselves, even from this little folly in your life. You need to purge yourselves so that you can bear more fruit, that you can have a sweet savor, so that more people will get saved. Because there's only so much time that we have, okay? Why do we go to the poor areas in general? Okay? Think about, like, why do we remember the poor, as the Bible says? We remember the poor, and why we go to areas that aren't like Greystone, which we were driving through Greystone yesterday, and I'm like, this is like probably the worst place that we're to ever go soul winning. You know, I was joking, I'm like, hey, we should go soul winning out here next week. It's the richest place that I've been in in Morgantown, probably. But, uh, why, why, don't, why are we not going to Greystone, and why are we hitting places that we maybe hit more than once, hit, it, hit more than once, uh, that's a poor area, because more people are going to get saved in poor areas, because he had made the poor rich in faith, because, and there are many reasons on why, you know, the rich are not going to end up getting saved in most cases, but a lot of it has to do with pride. You need those that are humble in spirit that are going to get saved. And we're not going to beat our heads against the wall when it comes to that. So we need to walk circumspectly, meaning wise, cautious, and how we're doing everything. But this needs to be an aspect when it comes to what you're doing in life, okay? How you conduct yourselves, how you speak, how you, what you do, right? And uh, I'm not one that's like, oh, you got to live this austere life where you don't have any fun, okay? I'm not saying you can't have fun, you can't do things that are fun, you can't do anything that's outside of church. That's not what I'm saying. But when things are uh, very clearly like, hey, I probably shouldn't be doing this because this is going to look bad, go to, uh, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is where you can get into doubtful disputations, meaning that there's certain things that just aren't spelled out. Like, it doesn't say don't go to this event. It doesn't say don't go to that. It doesn't say, you know, like, for example, it doesn't say don't go to a rock concert in the Bible, okay? But at the same time, if I went to like some like, what's a band that, uh, if I went to a Metallica concert, okay? Let's just use that as an example. And people saw me at that Metallica concert, how much respect are people gonna have for what I have to say about the Bible after I get, you know, get out of that Metallica concert, okay? You say, well, it doesn't say don't listen to rock music. It doesn't say don't listen to, well, it doesn't say don't, you know, the Song of Fools. But um, what I'm, what I'm going to get to here is in verse 21, it says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. And you can get into doubtful disputations in this view, like, well, what's the appearance of evil? I know some people that won't play cards, like they won't play spades or well, hearts, which I don't like hearts anyway, so I don't want to play that. But 
They won't play cards because cards are used in gambling. To me, I think that's ridiculous. Okay, I'm just going to be honest with you. Okay, I think you're stretching things a little too far at that point. But here's the thing, though. If you feel that way and you're like, I don't want to be seen holding a deck of cards because they may think I'm a magician, they may think that I'm, like, I, I'm into gambling and I'm playing Texas Hold'em and I got a gambling problem or whatever, if, that, if that's you, then you know what, then don't. But to me, if we're going to play a game of spades, I don't believe that's like going to look bad. Okay. So what I'm saying with this is that there's some there's a lot of gray areas when it comes to this, but we need to be thinking about it, right? You need to be thinking about like, hey, I don't want to go into this store, for example, that's known for this one thing. I'm just giving an example, right? That's, for example, let's say there, they have these vape shops and tobacco shops or whatever, okay? And I'm not saying like smoking like cigarettes is the worst thing in the world, but it's not a good thing to be doing, okay? But if there's something in that, that shop, you know, that wasn't bad, I'm probably not going to go into that shop because of the appearance of evil. Is it a sin for me to go in there? I don't believe it's a sin for me to go in there. Does it make sense? Like, I don't think that's, that's a sin, but it can look really bad. Okay. What if someone seems to pop out of a vape shop or something like that? You know, that, that's, that's what you got to think about, okay? Because... Even if you weren't doing anything wrong in there, it could look bad, and then that's going to come back, and it could send forth a stinking savor, even if it wasn't even wrong to do, right? But obviously, if, it, if you were doing something wrong, um, then you know, that's going to send forth a stinking savor. I'm just saying that we need to be like above reproach when it comes to this. In uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, that's what it says here. This is dealing with our, our speech, if you will. And just so you know, I'm not perfect in any of this stuff, okay? I want, you to be, I want this to be very clear. When you're dealing with stuff like this, abstaining from the appearance of evil, when you're talking about your speech and all this stuff, just know this, that we're talking about things, that we're talking about the little folly stuff, right? We're talking about stuff that we probably all mess up on this. Actually, I know every single one of us messes up on this. Let's, let me rephrase that. We all mess up on this, Okay? But we need to be cognizant of it. We need to be thinking about it. We need to consciously be saying, hey, I need to make guard myself to maybe what I'm talking about here. Now, what it says, it says here in Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 29, it says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Okay? So corrupt communication in Colossians chapter 3, and verse 8, it says, uh, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Okay? So, think about things that, I'll give an example. Bedroom, the bedroom, right? It says marriage is honorable and the bedroom undefiled. Okay? That's between you and your spouse. Okay? We shouldn't be, like, just talking about what happens in the bedroom. Okay? That's, I think, a pretty easy one that we could probably think about. Even if, well, I'm just, I'm just going to be frank, you know, like, I don't, I don't want to know what you and your spouse do, okay? I don't need to know any of that information, okay? Even if you're, if you're coming to me with marriage counseling questions, keep that very, very PG, okay? I, I don't want to hear about all the ins and outs and of, like, what's going on or what's not going on and all this stuff. I just... That type of stuff needs to be something we're not talking about. It also talks about the fact that, um, uh, what's the word, the verse I'm thinking of here? Is it a shame to even speak of those things, of them which they, which they do in secret? You think about, like, think about the reprobates. We're in Pride Month, right? We talk about sodomy. We talk about men with men working that which is unseemly. Okay? Let's leave it at that. Some people, even Christians, will start saying stuff that they do more graphically, okay? Now, I've said this before. There's nothing that you could call a reprobate, call a sodomite that I would get offended by, okay? So, just to be clear on that one, <laughs> okay? But I don't want to hear what they do. Does that make sense? I don't want to hear about the acts that they do. 
you know, I know they do abominations. But, you know, there's things that they do that, you know, the, the Bible talks about how God, it says, they never even entered his mind. Right? It's not like, so I don't want to defile my mind. And here's the thing. In the Bible, it's a good judgment it call as far as how far to take certain subjects, right? When you think about uh, marriage, com- coming together, he knew his wife, right? I mean, you're safe when you're using the Bible way of saying things, okay? Now, is that to say, like, if you went a little further than that, it would be wrong? All I'm saying is that we need to be on the side of caution when it comes to our conversation, Okay? And you say, what about, what about uh, cuss words? I'll, I, want, I, I want to say this. The thing that, that I hate is when people use the Lord's name in vain. Okay? If, you want, if, you wanna, if you want the highest mark when people are saying things that, that I don't want to hear, stop using my Savior's name in vain. Okay? Like if, if I was out in a construction site and people were just letting all kinds of things fly, I'm probably not going to say anything to them unless it's the Lord's name that's being used, okay? Doesn't mean I agree with what they're saying. Doesn't mean I would say everything that they're saying, okay? There are words that I would consider words that I would not want to use, okay? Um, That a lot of times are dealing with maybe the bedroom or something like that. There are words that are more crass words, okay? That I think that um, they're not necessarily wrong to use, okay? But we should use them sparingly. Okay, what's a cra- What does it mean by crass? Meaning something that's kind of hard hitting, right? It's like, oh man, that's a, that's a rough word, right? Here's the thing with crass words: the more you use them, the less crass they become. Okay, so there's certain words that I'll even use from the pulpit, but I use them very sparingly because they're meant to get your attention, right? But if I used it all the time, you'd be like. Well, you know, that's just Pastor Robinson, you know, talking again. Okay. For example, the Bible uses the word piss. Okay. But, and that's a biblical word. I don't believe that's, I actually, I remember, I remember when I was, uh, when I was in college, one of my friends was making a list of cuss words and piss was on there. I'm like, that can't be right. (laughs) Someone also, I remember someone posted recently, they're like, you know, if there, was, if there was a list of cuss words, it would be written in the Bible of which ones it would be cuss words. I'm like, well, that wouldn't work because then it would be the Bible, and then it wouldn't be a cuss word, would it, <laughs> right? Because every word of God is pure. Here's the thing, though. It is subjective, and it's based off language, and it's based off, like, perception and all that, okay? So I, I'm not here to say, like, I got the list. All right, you want to see me after church? I got a list of words you shouldn't be using. So obviously there's judgment calls that are with that. But, for example, the word piss, I'm not just using that all the time in my modern vernacular. Okay. Why? Because when that word's used in the Bible, it's used meaning that, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you. Do you think that's like a light way of talking about things? That's what the Bible says because Rapshaki was talking to the men on the wall saying this is what's going to happen to you if you listen to Hezekiah. Okay. Crass words, but used, you know, sparingly, so that they hold their weight. Does that make sense? And obviously, any word that's in the Bible, it's not not a word. If someone's judging you, you're like, oh, he used the word hell. He used the word bastard. He used the word piss. It's like the Bible says it, so you're wrong. <laughs> okay, but. Uh, when it comes to other things as far as communication, what you got to think about, though, when you're giving communication is what's the reasoning, right? You know, why are you using that word, right? Why are you speaking about that subject? And it should be for edification, right? Okay. So um, just something to think about when it comes to our speech, our conversation, what we're doing. Because uh, if, if I was out in public and I was just like to the world standard cussing up a storm, right? Then, you know, people are going to be looking at me like, he's a pastor, he's a Christian, right? Even if they use it all the time, right? Because they're always hypocritical about it. They're like, well, I use it, but I don't claim to be like something. So therefore, it's messed up. And, and like getting back to like school, if 
this person, this kid over here just cusses all the time. They say whatever they want to say. They do whatever they want to do. But then the good kid that doesn't never said a, they, the teachers never heard them say anything bad before in their life. Then they say something that's just like, you know, punishment to the nth degree. And part of that has to do with this, is that the teacher has higher expectations for you. Okay, so I don't blame the teacher that much. Besides, I do feel like I was, it was unequal. <laughs> but at the same time, they have higher expectations for you. And all I'm saying with this sermon, with this portion of the sermon, have high, just assume that God has very high expectations for you, okay? And the way that you live, the way that you talk, and what you do, as far as to not have a stinking savor toward God or toward men. Particularly toward men, right? Because we're talking about like what, where they see us outwardly, out, outwardly doing in the flesh. And so, that being said, we can all make mistakes in this area. We can all say things that we shouldn't say, but we need to try to nip it in the bud as much as possible, right? We need to try to have good communication to where to stop the mouths of the gainsayers, right? The Bible talks about young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded that in all things, uh, I'm going to misquote it now. <laughs> young men likewise uh, be sober-minded show thyself a pattern of good works. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to mess it up. Going to mess it up. It's always like right there, and you're like thinking of it, and then it just, just you lose it. So, young men, where's it at? Sound speech. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> so, uh, young men, likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Notice this, sound speech that cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. You know, and the idea there is that sound speech, right? Good speech, you know, it's, it's sound, it's solid. And here's the thing, it, sometimes when you use crass language, we're taking a risk that we may be going outside of that realm a little bit, okay? And sometimes I think it's worth the risk, just to be honest with you, because you need to get someone's attention. Okay. And someone may say, I don't think you should use that word, right? And especially when you're talking about like, uh, like, like the homos or something like that, and you're like, you know, I, I don't think you should use the word faggot. Right? Someone could say that and say, I don't think you should use that word. Well, here's the thing, though. That subject is so important that people realize that they're foul and they're filthy and that the Bible condemns them. I think it's worth using a crass word that someone's going to just be, oh, oh, man, what did he say? Does that make sense? Like, whereas I can't really prove from the Bible that, that, that I could use that word, but I kind of can because the Bible talks about how he's going to bundle up the tares to be burned. And what is a faggot but a bundle of sticks that's used to be burned? So I do have scripture. I just don't have the word there, <laughs> okay? in English that states that word. But that's an example of like a time where you could take a risk to say, you know what? I don't have like a Bible word that'd be like, well, chapter and verse, here's why I can use that word. But it's a risk that I'm willing to take to get someone's attention to say, hey, listen up to this. Hey, you need to see what the Bible says about these people. And you know what? It may kick you back in your seat a little bit, but so be it, okay? And I've heard people say, oh, that person's cussing from the pulpit because he used that word. You know what? In, in my opinion, like I said, there's nothing that you could say about those people that would offend me anyway. But I'm not here just to, I'm not to offend just to offend. Does that make sense? Meaning that if I'm going to use language like that, I'm not going to use it just to offend somebody. I'm using it to get your attention so that you'll be edified. Okay? That should be the reasoning. Okay? Now go to Exodus chapter 30, Exodus chapter 30 and verse 22. So I'm going to switch gears here real quick. And deal with the fact that when we're dealing with this ointment of the apothecary, in the Bible here, it's going to talk about the fact that it uses holy anointing oil. Okay? Exodus chapter 30, and verse 22, it says, Moreover, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels. So there's cinnamon in this thing, 
you know this is going to smell good. Okay? I don't know what it smells like, but there's cinnamon. It says in a cassia, 500 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, and, and of olive oil and hen. And it says, and, they shall, and thou shalt make it an oil of holy anointment. I'm sorry, oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be an holy anointing oil. Okay? Now, it's going to talk about anointing different things, like the tabernacle and all that. But then look at verse 30 there. It says, And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. So the priests were anointed with this holy oil. Okay? Now, let me switch gears here. The Lord Jesus Christ is the anointed. Okay? And notice what it says, Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 Hebrews chapter 1 talks about how he was anointed with the oil of gladness. And notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8 here. It says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteous, righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now what's this talking about specifically? But him becoming the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You know, the, the, Le the Levitical priests, like Aaron and his sons and everybody that came down the line, they were anointed with oil, but they die, they have an infirmity, and it's talking about how he's anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. And you could obviously see how this is talking about the Spirit of God as well, because it talks about how he giveth, that the Father giveth the Son the Spirit without measure, and, you know, dealing with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. But also... What's anoint even mean? Christ. Okay? And you don't have to turn there. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 5 for sake of time here. But you can, you can figure this out because in Psalm 2, it says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers took counsel uh, uh, together against the Lord and against his anointed. In the New Testament, when it quotes that passage, it says against his Christ. Okay? But you can probably think of that term christen. You probably have heard that term like christening something. It's anointing something, okay? So, uh, anoint to christen, right? Uh, Christ means anointed, okay? So, even, that's who Jesus is. We have to believe that he is the Christ, that he is the anointed, that he is the Messiah, which is another word also meaning Christ. Now, uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. We are called to have a sweet-smelling savor, Right? But notice that Jesus is a sweet-smelling savor unto, the, un, unto God the Father. It says in verse 1, it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Now, I want you to think about this. He's the anointed, and he is a sweet-smelling savor. Now, this gets into uh, so many sacrifices, right? You think about it in Leviticus, it talks about these sacrifices, the burnt offerings, the sweet-smelling savor goes up to the Lord. But think about this. Just, you know, at least a couple dead flies will cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth the stinking savor. You know what this shows you is that Jesus, one, is without sin. No sin, okay? There's no dead flies in that ointment, okay? With men, there's going to be dead flies. With men, there's going to be a stinking savor. Okay? And fleshly speaking, not with God, not with Jesus. And I want to go through a tour, tour de force real quick with you here. If you want to keep up with me, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 21. It says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So it says that Jesus knew no sin. Go to uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Now, we're supposed to be like Christ, right? I mean, that's the whole idea is that we're supposed to follow in his steps. So when we're talking about being a sweet-smelling savor, we're talking about reigning in the flesh, the lust of the flesh, but we're trying to be like Christ, okay? But know this is that Jesus does not have any dead flies in his ointment, okay? He's, he's the sweet-smelling savor. There is no stink coming from that no stink of sin if you will in hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14 it says seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens jesus the son of god 
let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So what do we see so far? Is that he knew no sin? It says he's without sin. Now go to chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. Remember that ointment of the apothecary was poured on Aaron and his sons, but they had infirmity. They had sin. Not Jesus, though. Verse 26, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, notice this, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. So he knew no sin, he's without sin, and he's separate from sinners. He's in a whole other category. Does that make sense? Like he's not included with sinners. Okay. Notice what it says here, and uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, if you ever want some verses on Jesus being sinless, here you go, <laughs> okay? Um, these are great verses. You don't, I mean, if you're out soul winning, usually one of these is going to prove your case, okay? You don't need to go through all of these, but, uh, you know, pick a couple maybe that you have memorized or have at least uh, marked to where you can go to. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, it says, For even hereunto were ye called... Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So he knew no sin. He was without sin. He's separate from sinners. And it says he did no sin. Now one more, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5. I put these in order. Try to help out here. Like, is there a reason you have it in that order? Yeah, that's the reason. <laughs> so, First uh, John 3 and verse 5, it says, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So, recap, right? It says that he knew no sin, he's without sin, he's separate from sinners, did no sin, and in him is no sin. You say, why did, why did God say it so many different ways? Because you know that there's someone out there be like, well, it doesn't say... Now it says there's, he knew no sin, but he, did he do sin, though, right? You know, well, it says he didn't do any sin, but was there sin in him, though, right? You can see how people will be like, well, what about this, what about this? And the Bible is just like hitting all bases, right? It's like he did no sin, he knew no sin, he's without sin, he's separate from sinners, right? That one to me is just like, get the point that there's no sin involved in Jesus besides the fact that he became, he was made to be sin for us. He took our sins on him, okay? So, that being said, is that he has ointment that does not have dead flies. It's not bringing forth a stinking savor. But here's the thing that you have to understand with this. Salvation is by Jesus Christ alone, not by us at all. And if I think of a, a secondary meaning to uh, this passage of the dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor, it's people that add works to salvation. It stinks disgusting when you think about the fact that jesus is the only one that is is pure and is has that sweet smelling savor to think that we could be a part of that at all is repulsive okay and let me give you uh, what the bible says here in philippians chapter 3 philippians chapter 3 and verse 8 here i love this because it, it just shows you that salvation is I mean, there's so many different passages that say the same type of thing, but I love Philippians chapter 3, and verse 8 and 9 here. It says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Notice how it's separating your righteousness and his right. It's not even saying, you know, not by, you know, like people will say, well, you, you need to not do these certain things. Well, that's righteousness. You know, if you're going to keep the commandments of thou shalt not, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, and you go down the line, that's righteousness to keep those laws. You don't believe me, go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 25. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 25. Keeping the law is your righteousness. But it's not by our righteousness. He doesn't want to be found in his righteousness because what? He count that all but dung. That's what he regarded his righteousness to was dung. And it's interesting that flies, if you were to think about like why flies are disgusting, 
is because what do they fly on a lot of, most of the time, right? And why, you know, flies, you don't want, you know, flies get on your freezer, like, that's disgusting because you know where they've been, okay? But I'm likening those dead flies to sin, okay? And when we're dealing with all his righteousness, you know what, you know what Paul said and he likened his righteousness to? Dung. Notice what it says in verse uh, 25. You don't know what dung is, it's scat. You're like, what's scat? <laughs> Droppings, you know. Anyway, I'm halfway joking with that. You all know what dung is, right? So, but uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 25. It says, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Our righteousness is what? Keeping the commandments. But what did Paul say? It says, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, which is what Deuteronomy 6 is stating. That's, that's his righteousness, the law. Well, go to Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64 and verse 6. Isaiah 64 and verse 6. I want you to think about adding our righteousness to his. To his pure and holy oil that he's anointed with. The pure and holy Lord Jesus without sin. Let's add in us to that equation. And I'm going to say this. You adding in your works is like adding dead flies to the ointment of the apothecary. And it's going to stink. And it's not going to be a sweet-smelling sm savor of a sacrifice unto the Lord. And you're not going to heaven that way. Because it's going, it's going to stink. And everybody that's trying to get to heaven by their good works and adding in Jesus with that, listen, the ointment's fine, right? There's nothing wrong with the ointment, especially the cinnamon part of it. But that ointment is great. It's the dead flies, though, that are causing it to stink. And notice what it says in, in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. It says, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Does it say all our sins are as filthy rags? Is that what it says? It says all our righteousnesses. Because when people are saying, well, you know, I'm not, like, counting my... They'd say, well, I'm not counting my sins in that. You know, I, I just want to put my righteousness in there. The Bible says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags to the Lord. And I would say they're like dead flies in the ointment. And it's going to stink when you try to do that. Go to Galatians chapter 2. And really, I'm just going to do, last thing I'm going to do here is a tour day for, for, through the book of Galatians here. On the fact that salvation is by grace through faith. And, you know, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. The Bible says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That is not an option. Okay? When we talk to people while out soloing on this, it's not an option like, Hey, good news, there's an easier way. No, there's the only way. Okay? It's not like, oh, we're providing, we're just, we're giving you the good news that there's, this is an easier way to go here. You don't have to do all that stuff. You just have to believe. No, that's the only way. You do it the other way, it stinks. It smells awful. To the Lord, it's a stinking savor that's coming forth when someone adds works to salvation. That's what it says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21. Galatians 2 and verse 21, it says, I'm sorry, verse 16. Let's start in verse 16 there knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Sounds repetitive, but there's a reason. The Bible's repetitive for a reason because it's getting a point across that it's by faith, not by works. It's by faith, not by works. It's by faith, not by works. Notice what it says in verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So, another way to look at this is that when, when someone believes that they have to do good works to get to heaven, they're saying that Jesus isn't enough. 
Why? Because in Galatians 3, it says, For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But guess what? It's not by the law. It's either by grace or it's by the law. You mix those two together, it stinks. You're mixing in your filthy rags with salvation. And those that believe works are involved, they're sending forth a stinking savor. Those false prophets that are spewing out that you have to do good works, stinks. It's disgusting. Every time I hear a false prophet saying that, no, you can lose your salvation, no, you have to be good, no, you have to keep this, and you have to do that, it's not once saved, always saved, it's not eternal security, it stinks. It's disgusting. And to God, it's disgusting. You know why? Because they're saying that Christ died in vain. Because it's, it's dead flies in the ointment is what it is. Dead flies in the ointment. It's filthy rags that are put with the pure Lord Jesus Christ. No, you need the pure Lord Jesus Christ to take away that filthy garment that's spotted by the flesh. Because it says, enough, some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And that we need a change of garments. Our filthy rags aren't going to just turn in to, like, pure rags on its own. No, those need to be taken off completely, right? It's not going to be changed. You know, it's just take them off like Joshua, the son of Josedek, and, and Zechariah. Take off the filthy garments and put on the new, right? And now Galatians chapter 3, you can get into that as well, um, where it talks about how we're justified by faith. And, uh, and not by the works of the law, okay? And, but go to Galatians chapter 5, and the last thing I'll show you here is that it's all or nothing. Salvation's all or nothing. It's either all by faith or it's all by works. You try to mix it in there, it stinks. You try to mix it in there, it's filthy. It's filthy rags. I mean, think about if you had like a good-looking garment and then you, put, and then you sewed, in, sewed in some filthy rags on there. Wouldn't you, would you say that's a good, clean garment anymore? And I don't really care how much of that filthy rags you use to patch it up. It's still filthy. Okay? Just as much as you add, uh, you, you know, the, uh, the idea of, like, putting uh, a little bit of, let, let's say you have a, a this is, a, you know, uh, clean water here, I suppose, right? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> but if I put in a little bit of arsenic, and I just put a little bit of, like, arsenic in there. Is that good to drink? Is that going to kill me? That's the idea with salvation. One little thing. One little thing that you add to that pure water, it's filthy. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Meaning this, it's not grace. It's not grace if you're justified by the law at any point. It's dead flies in the ointment is what it is, and it stinks. So know this, Christian, that you're held to a high standard in this world. We're trying to be like Christ, but we know that we can't holistically be like Christ to that T, but we're trying to. And know this, is that a little bit of folly is going to cause your savor to stink in this world. So we need to live above reproach. We need to just keep everything tight as much as you can. We all make mistakes, but at the same time, just, be, just, be, uh, just know that that's the case. Okay. Then it comes to salvation. You add in, you can have the, the greatest ointment, the great sweet-smelling ointment that you have. You add in dead flies to that, it stinks. You add a little bit of your righteousness in there, stinks, because it's filthy, okay? And salvation needs to be clean. We need to keep the gospel crystal clean. That's why this repentance of sins, garbage type of salvation that's out there, it needs to be nipped in the bud, because you know what that is? Dead flies. Repenting of your sins to be saved is dead flies. Making Jesus Lord of your life, meaning that, you have to, to basically give your will to the Lord to be saved, then 
Dead flies. Stinks. Here's the crystal clear message of the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Period. You know, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. That's it. At that point, if you're saying, but, then stop talking to me. You're adding flies into the ointment. Keep it crystal clear. Get your dead flies out of my ointment. Get your filthy rags away from my Savior. Keep that ointment pure and clean in your life and keep the gospel pure and clean from any type of dead flies that are trying to fly in. So let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word. And just pray that you'd help us to live uh, above reproach. Help us to obviously try to have the best conversation in this world that we can. Uh, but also with the gospel, Lord, that you help us to keep it crystal clear, keep it clean, and keep any type of things that would make it stink out. And Lord, we just uh, pray to you be with us as we go out soul winning today and bring us back at the point in time in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.